Morning guys. It's kind of early this morning, so I'm having a bit of coffee. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, oh. My friend Pierre Shape. And um, how are you doing? I'm tired, man. Actually, it's way too early. I, I don't care. I don't care. Okay, guys. Um, today we're going to talk a bit about your theme. Um, and it's called uh, World Through a Viewfinder or My World Through a Viewfinder. And that doesn't mean my world or his world or anybody else's world. It means your world. Right. So, guys, um, quickly about mind maps. A lot of guys ask me why do I have to complete a mind map? Like, it takes so much time writing all those words on a piece of paper. Is it important or you just want us to write down a lot of words so we have something to do? So guys, that is not true. Not 100% true, right? <laughs> um, I want you guys to see it like this. Imagine you want to do some research or you find something really interesting and let's use somebody like Kim Kardashian, right? Um, so you think oh this is a really interesting beautiful lady and you want to do a bit of research about Kim Kardashian does she sing Mr. Pierce? no I don't think no no I don't know okay anyway oh. all right you start off guys and you go to YouTube and you and you listen to um, or look at pictures of her whatever and then you end up Wikipedia right and then from Wikipedia guys you end up finding oh my goodness oh she is the sister of that Jenner girl <laughs> you go but that's interesting and you go into that and four hours later guys you've ended up looking at pictures of racing cars and this is basically how our minds work and this is basically how our mind maps all right so the one word leads you to something else and that leads you to something else and that idea leads you to something else and the um, your imagination is almost limitless and and, and there's uh, many words and it might have nothing to do with what you actually started off with so this is what a mind map is all about it's all about about the process by the way guys your final artwork is going to be a painting but your final artwork is also the mind map because the painting might be the result, but the journey is the artwork. So your artwork starts when you write down that first word in that mind map and it ends when you actually varnish that final painting. All right, so viewfinders, guys. I've brought along a couple of cameras here. First one I want to show you guys is this one. It's called the Brownie C. It's a camera made by Kodak, very old camera. And um, at the back here, it's got a little a little glass section. Wow, it's actually plastic and it's a little hole. You look through it and I can see a camera, a tiny camera and that's basically you guys. So this at the back guys would be the viewfinder and the way I see the world or the camera in this case or you guys through the viewfinder is completely different um, in when I look at you guys like this. Right. right. Next one is a, um, it's called the Cinemax 8. It's an old video camera, very old video camera. Same thing, guys, it's got a viewfinder. So I can use it, and at the back there, I can have a look. You'll see it's got two lenses, and I, I, I can actually see the lens through this viewfinder as well. <laughs> and I can again see a picture through a little hole. Viewfinder. Right, and then the camera I'm using today. This is a full camera. It's a uh, Minolta. You'll hear it's got a very nice sound. Very nice sound. And um, again, you can see a viewfinder. So there's some pictures. Well, I can see the viewfinder and I can see your picture. So this is basically what a viewfinder is, guys. So yeah, let's start there. A lot of things to look at. A lot of new words, right? And this is only a viewfinder. Think about world or your world, how many words you can write down. So this is where it starts, guys. It starts with a mind map. We're also going to, after this, guys, do some artist research. I'm going to give you a couple. You're going to find a couple on your own. And then you're going to start doing your conceptual drawings again. And um, that will lead to a final painting. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Somebody's phoning me. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
<laughs> I'm not going to pick this one up for now, guys. Let's finish the video. So, um, it's strange when people phone you and you're actually recording videos, right? I think that call was for you, not for me. Um, anyway, alright guys, so the last thing I want to talk about is, is um, uh, an artist that I find very inspiring and that is Mr. Rembrandt Van Rijn. And I'm not going to talk a lot about him, I just want to tell you, he's one of those masters that's really important, especially when it comes to technical abilities when you start painting. So we're going to have, have a quick look at Mr. Van Rijn and um, hopefully you, you guys will enjoy his biography and his quick story and we'll have a lot of chats about him a bit later as well. Um, guys, look after yourselves and be good and we'll definitely see you soon. Is it shape? Anything you want to add? Good. Great. Bye guys. Rembrandt was born on July 15, 1606 in the Netherlands. The self-portraits of his youth give us a glimpse of a young man holding a grudge against the world. His face wide with beady eyes, a broad nose, and a powerful jaw. At 18 years old, he spent six months training under a master painter in Amsterdam. In that time, Rembrandt deconstructed his master's work, analyzing his every technique before mastering and taking them as his own. Rembrandt opened his own studio at 19 and painted scenes from the Bible with a profound sense of God, man, and nature. He was perhaps inspired by his mother, whom brought together the family around a small wood table reading the scripture by candlelight. Word of the young master painter spread rapidly, and at 22 years of age, Rembrandt was already taking students into his workshop. Rembrandt was a master of light and darkness, like the rays of light offering salvation to the disciples caught in the dark and stormy sea of Galilee. His students learned like he did, deconstructing and reconstructing his works, analyzing his every technique. Over time, Rembrandt became the master of over 50 students. The master painter was also an avid collector, his knowledge of art history was vast and he enjoyed collecting paintings from old masters of the bygone era. He also collected antiques, minerals, and exotic items from foreign countries, like suits of armor from Japan. Rembrandt's self-portraits show an artist who had grown confident from his success, but in his middle age he saw the death of all but one of his children, and his wife Saskia fell ill from tuberculosis. Rembrandt's last paintings of his wife are on her sickbed shortly before she passed. With little family left to keep him in check, his careless spending habits left him bankrupt. In the wake of this, Rembrandt lived with his only surviving son and his maid. His paintings during this time were more contemplative. The master painted up till his death on October 4, 1669, and was buried in an unmarked grave. He had outlived his son by one year, and was only survived by his granddaughter. Rembrandt is known as one of the greatest European artists, not only because of his mastery of technique, but his great empathy for men. His portraits and biblical scenes show the depth of his understanding of the human condition.